Hey guys, it's Ellie in space here at the Ascend Space Conference and we are in day one of the conference here in Las Vegas. We're actually seeing a record turnout this year with over 1,500 people from across the world, all different walks of life. We have students, we have top space leaders here, so I'm excited to share some of these interviews with you. I spent three days at the Ascend Space Conference. I was able to speak with some people that we've never heard from before on my channel, including Pam Melroy, who many of you are familiar with. I wasn't able to speak to some people that I had on my list, including William Gerstenmeier for SpaceX, who says he just can't comment publicly right now. But I also met some people that I didn't know their names before the conference, and I think you'll really enjoy hearing their stories. Ellie in space here with Pam Melroy, the NASA Deputy Administrator. Great to talk with you today. I want to know how your experience at Ascend has been so far. Well, thanks, Ellie. It's really fun to be here with you, and it is awesome to be at Ascend, where our whole community gathers together to have some really interesting conversations. I want to know, how has the rise of SpaceX as the dominant force for U.S. rocket launches transformed or evolved NASA's role? It's been an awesome partnership. We feel proud of the fact that we invested in SpaceX early on by asking them to take on cargo delivery to the space station. And uh, they have really been an amazing partner in their extraordinary successes. They have done wonderful things for us because they have transformed the cost of access to space. And so what that means is that NASA can do more of our mission with the scarce dollars that we get for our right. mission. Right. And in particular, I love the innovation that we're seeing, especially in our science missions. I mean, we're just shooting things up into low Earth orbit <laughs> to study the Earth, study the solar system at much lower cost than we had before. So uh, it's been a wonderful partnership, and I think we've learned a lot from each other. Right, absolutely. What is the hardest thing about dealing with the executive office of the president or Congress? <laughs> I know, a spicy question, I'm sorry. Spicy, spicy. <laughs> no, I think really, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the thing, and uh, the administrator is great about this, he's really, really understands it well, they don't always understand space. They're right. living across all the agencies, the breadth of everything that the federal government does, from national security to agriculture, you name it. And so to help them actually understand who NASA is, what we're good at, and what we do, and what we bring to bear, uh, in every possible way, technically, geopolitically, and so forth. So it's really just kind of getting across the really simple idea. Who are, who is NASA and what do we do? Right, absolutely. Only a few more. How does the government view competition in space with nations like China and India? Well, it, it, it is interesting. I think uh, there is tremendous competition these days across many different sectors, mm -hmm. especially economically in our world. I think there's a lot of discussion around that geopolitically is um, economic competition. But what's interesting is that in so many ways space transcends that. And the example that I would give is India is an economic competitor, but we are not competitors in space. We are partners right. and we are working together. And that's really the way that we think we should be doing this because all countries border space. So we have to work together for a safe and sustainable space. Well, and if we could all have the overview effect, I think we would all understand that more. I mean, it would, would change things if we all had the overview effect. It would for sure. Um, a recent Space News article reports NASA is mm -hmm. considering cutting the budget of two of its biggest space telescopes as it faces broader spending reductions for astrophysics programs. How will the recent cuts in the NASA budget affect na future space missions, these telescopes? Wow, we are in a very tough budgetary situation. I think everybody is watching the news and they know what's happening on the Hill. Uh, you know, uh, clearly we're disappointed. The president asked for a budget for us for uh, fiscal year 24 that we think enabled us to do a lot of things with our mission. Unfortunately, given the conversation, we're just not sure we're going to get that full amount. But th what that means is as good stewards of our resources, we actually have to take a very hard look at everything that we're doing and ask what the return on investment for our mission is and really put things on the table to make the trades so that we can continue to do the things that we do well right. instead of everything kind of badly because we <laughs> can't get enough money. We have to focus and we have to pick the things that we're going to commit to. 
quality over quantity. Yes. One of the most memorable moments of Ascend this year was when we got a call from NASA astronauts Laurel and Jasmine from the International Space Station. So I understand that you guys are both in the midst of your first mission to the space station. Can you tell us your first thoughts when you reached the orbiting laboratory? Yes, and we have you loud and clear now, by the way. Welcome to the space station. So, it's funny, my, some of my first thoughts were actually, where am I? Um, you know, we get trained for hundreds of hours back on Earth in the mock-ups at Johnson Space Center, but when you get here and come into, you know, I, we docked to Zenith, so we were coming in to Node 2 from up above, and it was a different angle than I never looked at it before. And I was just so disoriented. So I think I spent my first week uh, just feeling very disoriented and not knowing which way to turn, left or right. And for me, um, the first, like my most vivid memory of when I got to Space Station was actually seeing it from Soyuz as we were approaching Space Station. Um, I had a window right next to me and I looked out and all of a sudden, you know, I was like looking inside working and then the next time I looked out, my whole window was just filled with a solar array and then the truss of Space Station and actually our airlock and some of our other modules. And just seeing it in person for the first time um, was, like my first thought was like, oh my god, this is so beautiful. And also, um, it just really, like I've, I've known what a complex and impressive vehicle it was, but seeing it in person for the first time um, really made me realize like just what an achievement it is that we've accomplished and um also, it's just, yeah, just incredible to see it. Elliot Space here at the first day of the Ascend Space Conference with Daniel Suarez. And Hello. give us a little bit about your background and title. Sure. Uh, I, for many years, I worked in software development. And at some point back in 2008, I wrote a, a book that became a New York Times bestseller. And that sort of changed my life. Wow. And that was about cyber war and cyber espionage. And generally, I have a brand where I write about real world technologies that are on the cusp and are about to change the world. Right. And space is definitely that. So oh, that's why I'm writing about space. Uh, right now I'm working on a trilogy of books that I call the Delta V Trilogy. And I'm on the third book of that trilogy. Wow. So it's part of what I'm doing here today. And I mean, no better time. I feel like our space industry is just getting started and we've seen you know, a, a lot of um, excitement and acceleration in yeah. recent years. And I think for good reason. Uh, so many startups right now are, are beginning the technologies and the innovations that are going to make this possible and economical. I think it's, it's really opening up this frontier. Personally, I think it's half a century late. Uh, a lot of the technologies that, uh, that you see are, could have been done years ago, but for various reasons, whether the end of the Cold War, what have you, they were not pursued. Right. And I think what really underwrites a lot of this is climate change. It, it, it brings a sense of urgency to this endeavor. I think the unlimited resources and energy of space could really help alleviate some of the problems and challenges we have on Earth, uh, but also could give opportunity to people straight around the world. So it's a really positive message too. How do you hope that your books help shape our future and turn it from fiction into nonfiction? Yeah, I guess that's something that I, I do. I've been referred to as a futurist, although that wasn't my intention, because a lot of the books that I've written have since parts of them have come true. And it is my earnest hope that that's the case here. Give me a good example of that. Well, for example, Kill Decision was a book that I wrote about uh, that involved lethal autonomy. Uh, drones that make a kill decision, basically, algorithmically. And of course, we've seen as the Ukraine war is starting to show, there's a great expansion of that, of uh, kamikaze drones doing things. Well, I wrote about that in 2011, 2009. And unfortunately, that was supposed to be a cautionary tale. Uh, wow. But the good thing about space in this case is I'm writing uh, about a much more inspirational uh, story here. So if my track record is still hold, holds up and this starts to come true, then we're all going to be better off. The idea that I really want people, mainstream readers, to understand why space matters to them. Right. Because I'm always amazed that, that people do ask me that. Like, well, why would I want that? Why would we right. want to spend money on this? Especially when we have so many pressing problems here on Earth. And I think. Well, what I'm trying to do through this fiction is help them understand that, that those are integrally related. Right. 
that if we go out into space, we can start addressing these problems. And moreover, by working together out in space, not just the overview effect, looking back at our beautiful Earth and realizing that, that you can't see the borders up from up there, that we have a great deal in common, and that we are all alone on this Earth in this great universe. We've got to work together. Uh, but also people working together in a challenge and that's difficult. And coming to a solution together, I think that could build a peaceful future and, and one that's promising and ever expanding. So, a very positive message if you ask me. And also, true. Peace on Earth and beyond. Yes. I think, you know, not only a, a futurist comes to mind when describing you, but also a visionary. How are you yeah. able to, I mean, one of the themes here is Space 2050, right? We're trying yes. to envision what that's going to look like. You've really taken that journey pretty far ahead. How are you able I to? Have. I have. I've been very grateful for my readers because my readers tend to be all over the map. They are accomplished people. They're inquisitive people. And the good thing about that is I'm trying to write books that challenge readers, but also bring very real technologies and, and, and science to these stories. What I'm writing about in these books is one way that we could get to that cool future that we imagine and we see all the time in sci-fi, but is always a couple hundred years away. It's like, how do we connect the present to that future? And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to assemble all of these various technologies and innovations and innovators, uh, adventurers, to try to reach that future. And, and I basically stand on the shoulders of, of giants, the people who've actually done some amazing things. I interview them, I bedevil them, I ask them all sorts of questions, and then I try to combine all sorts of things, geopolitics, economics, science, into a compelling story that has a conflict and a resolution, all of that stuff. So I, I guess that's, if I have a superpower, it's that, is to try to distil, distill the very complex into something that is involving and makes you feel something. Right. Because when it comes to uh, mainstream readers especially, it's hard to remember all the scientific details, but if you make them feel something, they'll remember. 100%. So. Uh, they won't necessarily remember the words, but they'll remember how yes. it made them feel. Yeah. And where it might have led, and right. hopefully somewhere desirable in this case. One of you know the, the things that we're looking forward to is continued access to space and also having a more uh, diverse set of people in space, sure. diversity just in the space industry. So in your words, why is that important to continue to pursue? Well, that goes back to the global problems we have. I mean, we're not going to be able to send just a few people up to space to solve this because that would engender resistance. People would start to wonder why are we spending perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars and we have all these pressing problems on Earth. If everyone understands that they have a stake in what we do in space, that, that, that they're going to be part of that future, I think that, that becomes a collective task, That's, that we're all striving towards something good. And again, it's, it's economics, it's politics, it's culture. What value system are we bringing to space? Right. You know, we, we want to have a diversity of opinion. If we have this rich history, what, what would we do differently? given the chance. And I think the more voices we have in that, the better chance we have of doing better. So. Well, and this is your first time at Ascend, but you may notice that there are some young faces, not just in the yes. audience, but networking here. Yes. People that are students inspired to get into the space industry. Why is it important to you know, continue to pull in this younger generation into oh, space? Boy. I tell you, I, I look around, I'm jealous. Because if I was 25 years younger, I, I know what I would be specializing in. I mean, I was in software. Uh, I would be interested in aerospace and astronautics, and I can understand. I love seeing that. And I, I saw it, I was here recently for the DEF CON Packer Conference, I was telling you, because cyber, uh, cyber security used to be that. I see a lot of people, there in fact was a hack -a -sat comp competition at DEF CON. So space is sort of starting to bleed into everything, all right. of the disciplines, and I think that's because that is the future. That is the growth industry. Right. Young people are going to want to do it. It's going to require skills, STEM, it's going to require courage and imagination, all those things. So I'm thrilled to see young people. Well, it feels like during the Apollo era, you know, there was all of this excitement and then that kind of, you know, trickled off. And so yeah. we need to have it was our... Cold War, right? Right, you right. Know, we beat the Russians to the moon and okay, I guess we're done. Right. Uh, but boy, you know, you see the Apple show for all mankind, they, they were postulating what would happen if, if we had not stopped many of the technologies, as I mentioned up on stage, have existed for decades, and yet the economic case was not there. And I don't think there was a compelling political case either. I think there's now both. And, and again, I think there's an upside both economically. I look at it this way. 
we can either degrowth and shrink civilization, you know, and a lot of people feel that we're, we're acting unsustainably on Earth, but if we extend out in, into a cislunar economy, we can offload some of those polluting industries and create new industries. We can create solar power satellites to beam clean energy back to Earth to help Earth civilization be powered by clean energy while still providing economic opportunity for people, right. because that's the key. So it's not just an altruistic thing. There is also considerable upside. Right. Uh, it's, it's interesting hearing your background and your story. It almost sounds like you accidentally became a New York <laughs> Times bestselling author. I've actually said that at times. It, it's like, I guess you don't accidentally. I obviously was compelled enough to write the book that I did, which was Damon. But in, it, I was either going to write a white paper about these various concerns I had, who's going to read that. I figured I might as well do a thriller because I like thrillers. And I guess I had a knack for it because uh, I've loved to do it. I know I've been doing that full time ever since. This is Critical Mass is my seventh novel, and I'm working on the eighth now. I, I look at the stack of it, and it seems like a great deal of work, but it's been a, a labor of love. Wow, that is incredible. And it's just, you know, a good message to just do it, just yeah, try. Sure. Any other advice to the students and the younger people that are here? Oh, wow, my gosh, they probably have some advice for me. I would say this that. There is no technological or scientific impediment to this. We could have done this a while ago. So all it's going to take is for us to, to spend the money, to invest the time, to actually do it. And, and one, one more thing I would add, and, and this is partly described in my books, we have always had people who are adventurers and risk takers. And I think in recent decades, they've sort of been looked at oddly. They, they do things like base jump off buildings and they hang glide and stuff like that. But I would say that those people have always existed and they were always the trailblazers and the pathfinders. We've discovered all the earth and there's nothing left to map. And these people are itching to go and they are very technically adept at things. And I, I think you combine some of these young minds and, and these entrepreneurs with adventurous spirit like that, I think we could do a great deal in just a decade. I interviewed George T. Whitesides, who is not only running for Congress right now, but he was the former CEO of Virgin Galactic and former chief of staff for NASA. Based on his prior space experience and the fact that he's running for office, I wanted to get his opinion on the recent Senate hearing about issues with the FAA slowing down progress. All right, Ellie in space here at Ascend. You may recognize this face. Uh, George T. Whitesides is joining me. And I actually made a video last week that sparked a lot of interest in people. And I think it's a very important um, time to talk about sort of uh, the delays from the FAA and maybe, you know, the under uh, understaffed, the not enough resources. So one of the themes that I'm sure you would be familiar with, even if you didn't watch it, is um, is there a need for a more streamlined licensing process? And like, how do you relate to these issues that we're seeing? Well, here's what I would say. Um, it's really important that we get regulation right in the United States. If we do too little, that might not be the right thing. And if we do too much, that might not be the right thing. You know, so we have to get it right. That's for sure. And we're doing a lot of new stuff right now. I mean, you know, new launch vehicles, new efforts. Um, so often people are dealing with things that are, that are new and intrinsically there's some discomfort around that. Um, what I would say is that, you know, um, many of the companies working in this area really do want to make sure that safety is, is prioritized, like they're not stupid. And um, so uh, hopefully we can get a good balance between, you know, the regulators on one side and the companies on the other and do things so that you know, the uninvolved public is safe, but also that we're, so that we're able to make progress quickly and maintain our leadership in the world in space technology. Do you think it's unacceptable to have a vehicle ready for flight and the only, at least, seeming hang up is like the licensing process? Or is there is there more to this story? I don't know the specifics of anything related to um, Starship, so I'd hesitate to yeah, comment, comment on that. But. <laughs> I do know that you know we went through a very extensive licensing pro process when I was at Virgin Galactic. I think we actually got the first commercial spaceflight license. Wow. I'm not sure, but I think that's true. Um, and uh, you know, it took a long time, and there were binders full of stuff. And, right. Um, I guess based yeah. on your experience, do you yeah. think that 
things like need to be improved for humanity? Is humanity being held back by maybe an antiquated system where before we weren't seeing as much demand and acceleration in the private sector? Yeah, I mean, I think it all depends on like the specifics of, of certain, you know, details related to each license application. In general, I have found that uh, AST, which is the FAA division that regulates right. space transportation, has been, you know, relatively like effective and friendly for a very small team. Mm -hmm. You know, they only have like, at least in my day, which is a little outdated, you know, like 100 to 200 people, you right. know, and they're regulating companies that have 10,000 people right. or more, you right. know. And so there's an intrinsic bit of sort of power dynamic there that's kind of weird. You know, usually it's like airlines getting regulated by the FAA, which has 30,000 people, right? So it's like the other dynamic. But in space, right. it's totally the opposite. You know, uh, some of these other companies have a hundred times as many employees or a thousand times as many employees uh, as the companies themselves. And so, or sorry, than the FAA itself. So anyway, but that's not making a value judgment one way or the other. I think in a general sense, we need to make sure that we're moving promptly um, forward. And we have to recognize that um, the number one responsibility of the FAA is to keep the uninvolved public safe. safe when it comes to space transportation, right? right? And um, they take that responsibility seriously. And when you have, you know, very large vehicles, you know, they're interested in, you know, the impacts of that. So I, I basically I'm, don't know enough about it to be uh, good one way or the other, but uh, or to say anything really that interesting. Right. But what I do know is that in general, you know, people of good faith are trying to work on these problems and hopefully they can get to a good solution soon. And then do you know much about this whole learning period extension before I ask you about that? I know a lot about the learning period in a general sense because I lived with it for like, you know, when it was passed back in, I think, 2004. Right. You know, and then it went through many different extensions. And um, Should it be extended? Continue to be extended? <coughs> I'd have to look at like the details of, you know, whether it makes sense now. I do know that it did make sense for a long time for it to be extended. Um, because things are still early, right? And what we don't want to do is um, to create a structure where American companies can't succeed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't, I don't know enough about right now one way or the other, but I think that what I do know is that for a long time it definitely did make sense and, and was crucial to the success right. of the industry. Anything else you want to add just about the growing commercial space sector? I mean, it's really incredible. I think it's a super exciting time to be alive, you know? And uh, I tell people who are young, who are going into space right now, like this is the most exciting time since Apollo, right. right? There's so many different companies, there's so many different projects. It's a wonderful time to be involved in space. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just a really exciting time. And the ability for folks to be involved in like solar system exploration, as well as like big problems for planet Earth, while they're still you know, getting the same aerospace engineering degree or whatever it is, is wonderful. And I hope people can sort of manage both sides of that as they go forward. It never ceases to amaze me how many young people come to the Ascend Space Conference. This year was no different. In fact, I interviewed a student as young as 14 years old working on some pretty powerful stuff. All right, we're here at day two of the Ascend Space Conference. Ellie in space here with Cherry Chen, and it's your first time at Ascend? Yes, it is. So, um, why are you here? I mostly started doing this project as a bit of, I really enjoyed this whole concept of going to space and going to the moon and Mars. And so when I first started this, well, project that I'm working on, I didn't exactly think I would be coming to a conference mostly intended for professionals. But then again, um, life tends to take you where it's not expected. <laughs> so um, essentially, as I got further into this project, um, I thought, hey, I could write this into an actual paper and, you know, with my group of friends and mentor, help present this and get my ideas out to the world. And so, remind me, how old are you? I'm in ninth grade. I am 14. You're 14 years yes. old. Okay, and give us a little background about what the project is, because mm -hmm. not everyone knows. Yeah. This project, we are the, well, it's the Mars B project. It's about how to get Mars to become habit habitable 
And we're hoping to get all of it habitable, so not just like little pockets here and there, because I thought it was just more interesting. Um, and so it mostly started a couple years back, and um, I and a couple of friends, um, we just decided, hey, we know someone who is, you know, who does this for a living. How about let's reach out and see what we can do? Um, and so essentially this particular paper that we're presenting right now is about how to put a high temperature superconducting ring on the surface of Mars and use the magnetic shield, um, the magnetic uh, field, um, to create a magnetopause shield that can shield Mars from the solar wind that is stripping away its atmosphere so that it can slowly regenerate its atmosphere and become habitable for us as well. That is incredible that you're even doing this at 14 years old. That's, that is, that's insane. That's wonderful. And what has it been like so far to be at Ascend and, and network with, you know, space executives, leaders in the industry? So literally this morning, um, I come down here and I, I didn't know where the bathroom was, right? And I, so I walked up to someone and I was like, do you know where the bathroom is? And they looked at me with this kind of shocked expression of, why is there a 14 year old girl talking to me? Why is she here? Um, and so that was essentially, um, it's, well, it's unusual for both myself and the people around me, right. but thus far it has been a really fun experience to listen to all kinds of professionals in this field talk about something that I'm really passionate about. Right, and so you're hoping to get this paper in front of important people. Yeah. Uh, tell me more. Um, so essentially we came here because I thought this was a promising idea and I wanted to, I guess, quote unquote, do some networking um, to help meet people in the field to kind of just dip my toes into the water and see if there was something I could really do with this idea. You know, you're obviously a young person yeah. um, in space. Young people are the future of space. Do you think enough young people are interested in space? And if not, or if so, let me know. But how can we get them interested? I feel like a lot of people already enjoy the concept of space. They are excited about going to the moon and Mars, but they see all of these people who have been in this industry for like 30 years, 40 years, and they're like, how am I supposed to even start? Um, and so I feel like um, part, a big part of the Mars B project is the software that we use and the models that we program and um, we are currently working on how to get this also to be accessible to younger researchers like me. Hopefully we need to, we want to get it down to the level that even sixth graders are able to start learning about space and concepts like this throughout, um, you know, through our program. And so I think it's not the interest part that is needed because I feel like there are already young children who are right. interested in this topic. It's just we need to give them a staircase essentially. We need to pave the path for them to see, hey, look, young people can do this too. I mean, as evidenced by you being here, this is incredible. Yeah. And tell me just, we're, you know, one of the themes this year is diversity in space and mm -hmm. why that's so important. In your words, why do you think that's important? I think it's important as a sort of inspiration because I don't think that people should be discouraged from pursuing something they are passionate about because they are a person of color or they are, you know, from a different country or they are too young or too old mm -hmm. or et cetera. I don't think these should bar people from entering this, well, industry because this is our future. We are looking to get on the moon and we are looking to get on Mars and that right. means we need more people and more unique, diverse experiences and, well, perspectives than other topics might need. Fantastic. Great answers. Ascend.
While Cherry and her group work on how to make Mars habitable, let's meet some other high schoolers who are working on becoming the first high schoolers to construct a bi-propellant liquid-fueled rocket. Ellie in space here and I'm joined by... Arjun Babwa. And where are you from? Um, I'm a junior at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology and I'm here with Project Kalis. Tell us more about Project Kalis. Yeah, so Project Kalis is a group of high schoolers and we're trying to be the first high schoolers to construct a bi-propellant liquid-fueled rocket with an eventual goal for space. Wow, and so where are you at in that process currently? Um, so right now we just finished a complete propulsion system redesign, meaning that we have found like better ways to optimize our system and it'll get us there a lot faster. So we're expecting a static fire, which is when you strap the engine to like a pole and uh, put both propellants in and let it and see how much thrust it produces. We're expecting that to happen uh, this summer and we're expecting a launch maybe December of 2024. Wow, what is it like to be uh, involved in a project like this at such a young age? It's amazing. So when I joined TJ and I heard about this project, like I just knew that I had to be a part of it. And it has been one of the most, the most reward, rewarding activity in my high school career. And how did you guys find out about Ascend and, and make the journey here to Vegas? Um, we saw that you guys had a call for papers and we were working on a paper summarizing our process of development during um, building this rocket. So we just submitted it, we got invited, and we got the registration fee waived, so we came here. Here we go. Is it your first time in Vegas? It is our first time. What do it's you my first time in Vegas. What do you think? It's amazing. And how has the experience at Ascend been? I know you haven't presented yet. Yeah. Uh, it's been great being able to see all of like the innovation taking place, and um, the lectures are amazing. Um, from what I can understand of them. Right. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure you've noticed, you know, a lot of young people around here. So what do you, uh, how would you inspire other young people to get involved in STEM? I would tell that these young people that nothing is impossible. For example, something like building a liquid fueled rocket is something that's only been done by like professional organizations like NASA, SpaceX, and a select few universities. And the fact that like we're high schoolers and we're able to do something like this means that anything is possible. It's, it's really mind-blowing, honestly. What uh, inspired you to get involved in the aerospace industry? Um, I've just been in love, to, in love with space, airplanes, rockets since I was a kid. So it's been a passion that I've had forever. So like I said, the talent at this year's Ascend Space Conference was absolutely mind-blowing. And yeah, we're already planning for next year. In the summer of 2024, AIAA will be hosting two of its signature events right here at Caesars Forum in Las Vegas. The Ascend Space Conference will be back and we're excited to announce we'll be joined by the AIAA Aviation Forum. This unique experience is going to advance innovation in both the air and space domains. The global aerospace community will be coming together for a week like no other. So make your plans to attend beginning July 29th, 2024.